Hi, I'm Ethan. I love muzzleloading. Today, we're talking with Frank Jarbo of Parson John's Living History. If you know Frank Jarbo, you probably see him at Living History events here uh, around the United States, uh, portraying a, a variety of, of historic uh, characters. Uh, Frank calls it a, a character demonstration. Him and his wife, Carol, travel around to 42 different events a year. They're out 42 weekends out of the year, demonstrating and portraying different characters from American history. I don't want to say too much, but this episode went in a few different directions that I didn't anticipate it going, but I'm really glad that we went in those directions. Uh, and I don't want you to be turned off necessarily if, if you know, hearing that Frank portrays a, a minister or a pastor in the 18th century, we don't necessarily get into religious discussion, but we do discuss quite a bit about, about religion's cultural impact in colonial America and how that shaped various periods of American history and and how that leads to a, a better understanding of context in history. So it's it's not a religious discussion necessarily, but we, we cover some of these topics and how they relate to early America and then even a little bit to today and how we look at and how we study American history for the purpose of, of you know, living history and, and documented portrayal and research. So I hope that you enjoy this episode. I really did. It really got my gears turning. I think at a really good time as we head into kind of the end of 2022, as we're recording here and into 2023, uh, this has given me quite a bit to think on. And I, I hope that it does for you as well. And as always, I, I hope that it inspires you to do a little bit more of, of your own research when you can, uh, to dive a little bit deeper into, into muzzleloading and, and history in general. Hello, I'm, my name is Frank Jarbo. I've been interested in, in history for a number of years. Uh, back when I was, in, uh, was in, I was in college, I was in pre-theology. I was uh, going to study to be a minister, and uh, I did get sidetracked uh, through, throughout a bulk of, bulk of my life. But, but I, I became interested in history about, oh, the mid-80s, 1980s. Uh, we live about about 25 miles from the site of the beginning of the Second Great Awakening. And being a person that that has studied theology and doctrine and all that all all my life, uh, that that piqued an interest with me. So I started doing some reading and some some research, and uh, really that just kind of that just kind of percolated for uh, for quite a while, and then. Uh, we get to about uh, the year 2003, and I have an idea. I have an idea that I want to take the history that I've been studying concerning the First Great Awakening of the 1840s, the Second Great Awakening of 1800, and I want to go to churches and tell them the history of the revival. So in order to do that, I needed to get the proper clothing. So I went and uh, uh, started attending some uh, 18th century trade fairs. Uh, and the first uh, the first person that I met was Jack Goresh from uh, from St. Louis. I think Heritage Products was his store. And he asked me, he said, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I, I think I want to be an 18th century minister. And he said, oh, that would be great. And then the second person I ran into, I'm not going to name, because they asked the same question. And, and I answered the same way. And they said, Oh, what are you going to do? Come out here and spoil our fun? But, <laughs> but it was it was an an introduction into the reenacting world, and you know my focus changed almost immediately. Really, now, Carol, Carol, and I were doing these doing these things, and 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 I saw not just an opportunity, but I saw some really neat people doing some really neat stuff. Uh, you know, it's more than just crazy people dressing up in funny clothes. It was, it was people that were talking about buttons and fabric and guns and, and all of, all of these things in a historic context. And, uh, I, it, it kind of dawned on me really, you know, I'm, I'm kind of slow on the uptake sometimes, but, but if I wanted to know what was surrounding that first great awakening, second great awakening, what better way to know that than to put it into a historic context. Mm. So over the last nearly 20 years now, uh, I've, I've only gone and spoken in maybe two or three churches, but we're out 42 weekends out of the year at living history events. And uh, uh, that's where we are now. We, of course, we started out kind of slow, but uh, but 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 I'm, I'm still 
I'm still very impressed with the quality of people that we meet, the quality of their their historic research, and and realizing that that while I don't know anything about guns and shooting and things like that, but I, you know, I know enough to say. <laughs> But 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 there are other people that are asking the same questions about my expertise or mm-hmm. uh, or my wife's expertise. Uh, and, and when we put all those things together, we we build a context. Yes. And we can see the interaction between a Daniel Boone and a uh, George Whitfield. You know, those two never interacted. I just picked two names. Mm-hmm. But but we have we have folks from different uh different walks of life and how would they have re, uh, interacted back then? And we can apply that to learning that and, uh, and apply it to today. Right. So would you say it was kind of the material culture and the people that were studying that material culture that kind of redirected you into the living history side of things? Ab- absolutely. Absolutely. It was, hmm. uh, you know, I, 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 I stand in awe of, of, some of my, some of my good friends that 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 when we when we come into to contact with them, you know, it doesn't take a lot of imagination to see this person walking out of 1770 yeah. uh, toward me and 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 get those little inklings of feeling of uh, wow wow this this could be could be something that it would be it would be like right you know you know things things weren't black and white back. It, Things were in color. Yeah, yeah. You know, we, we look at old, we look at old movies from uh, from the you know the silent films and all that, and we think that everything preceding us was was monochrome and 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 all that. But no, no, we we can we can we can really really get a get an idea. Kind of an anecdote to go along with that. When I was in school uh, studying art, we um, we got into kind of the Greek sculptures. And, and right. all the all the major Renaissance sculptures in the buildings, even. And I didn't realize really in, until that point, I guess, kind of embarrassingly now, I'll admit it. But um, all of those were painted in full color. Right. You know, and that really changes how you perceive what we now just see as white statues. Right. But that, to me, really encapsulated how I think about history now as a young adult and as I'm diving into a lot more of this material culture is for me, the gateway was the, was the muzzleloading side of it. And the the timeline that you're talking about that early two thousands was a very similar timeline for my folks that we became as a family more and more interested in that's in the material culture side of it. And I think that's when I probably first had my, my very first interactions with, with you and Carol out at some events here in Indiana um, were those years, but it's, it's exactly right. You know, you're seeing it and you're able to see it when you put together all of this context, that full, not necessarily a full story because we can't go back in time, but you're right. seeing that context of how all of this would work together to the best that we know today. Right. And, and, and what's, what's, what's amazing again, we, again, we go back to the, to the early 2000s and I've got, we both have friends that have been reenacting since the, since the revolution ended. Uh, and, <laughs> and, and to see, to see the change in our research hmm. and what we thought was really great in, in 1976. And I remember those years I was, <laughs> I was in college at that, at that point, um, that was the fifth semester of my freshman year, I think. But it, <laughs> it was uh, different, very different. The, the, the clothing was very different. The research was very different. And, and the ability, uh, and, and I'm not sure what the, what the answer is, why, why can we research better now than we could then? Or did we just, were we only scratching the surface at that point? Mm. But, 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 to see, but to see how things, how things become, become more complete over time and yeah. to realize that in another 20 years, they're going to look back at Carson John and go, what was that guy thinking? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I, I hope the same for people looking back at me, you know, it's, it's that it, it's not necessarily a march of progress, but it's just, a, a, I think it's the kind of thing that the folks doing these portrayals, or I, I hope at least the folks doing portrayals in, you know, in the early 20th century that we see photos of, you know, getting back right. into muzzleloading and getting into the his, the history of America, because that's where we're both at. Right. It's the kind of thing that I hope that they can look down on and say, you know, this is where we wanted it to go. Like they would be happy yeah, to see exactly. yeah. it going and flourishing and, and so much 
more accuracy, more legitimacy, both in recognition of, you know, Joe Blow, you know, I can be out in my woods doing something and, and trying to recreate something that, you know, could be recognized academically as some kind of academic research. And there's kind of a, right. an appreciation that I see going back and forth now between kind of what would be considered the amateur commu community and, and that academic community now. Yeah. Well, there we go. We need somebody, some, some, somebody to offer a, uh, offer a, a degree program in living history. Yes, that'd be, <laughs> but it, what's interesting about that is, is I'm seeing more and more people that are interested in, and are active and are like museum staff and curators getting more right. and more interested in getting out and experiencing the stuff that they're working with every day. And I think that is a really uplifting uh, yeah, thing to absolutely. see. But yeah, you, because we, we have come through, we have come through a period of scholarship. Those in their ivory towers, so to speak, mm -hmm. do look down upon us that are, we, we uneducated these guys that, took five semesters to go through their freshman year. I'm not really proud of that, but, but it's the fact of, you know, right. if somebody wants to reenact my life, there, there you go. That's your first <laughs> uh, but, 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 but there, there, there is, there is a legitimacy in the amount of research that, that, that many of our friends are, are doing. Uh, and, and, and they're not just, they're not just looking back. Uh, one, one of my, one of my early thoughts in, in living history and, and, and some about the portrayals that we do, is we want to put our portrayal in the history and not be looking back saying, I think they would have done this, mm -hmm. uh, not, not projecting 21st century back into 18, 1800, 1700, whatever. Uh, but, but attempting to, to use the available data and, 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 and create that character in that, that year. In right. that time, in that place, doing that, doing that task, and responding uh, as that person would respond, and I, I think there's some value uh, in a in a scholarly way in in that that pursuit. Mm -hmm. So, for somebody who hasn't necessarily seen you at an event or, or asked you some questions at an event, walk us through that a little bit. So, when you go to an event, you are, you know. In, for lack of a better term, you're playing that character. You are, for all intents and purposes, as people talk to you, you know, unless they're, you know, somebody like me that walks up just to catch up with you to, to, with modern Frank Jarbo, you are informing and educating people and, and all the way down to responding to their questions as somebody would have in the era that you're representing. That, that, that is, that is what we, what we attempt to do. And, and there's a, there's, there's a give and take in that, uh, and uh, one thing that we that we attempt not to do is I, I do have some different voices that I use. Uh, mm -hmm. I have different characters that I do. Carol has different characters. When we send out a Christmas card, it is literally from all of us to all of you. So, I mean, we got uh, there's there's seven or eight of us here here in 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 in, in we two we two people. Mm -hmm. uh, so 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 I'm going to respond as old badger, or I'm going to respond as the parson, or I'm going to respond as the parson's son, Reverend Griswold. I'm going, you know, we got these, these, these different, uh, different, different, different ways. And, and the thing that I don't do, and, and I don't want to do, I, I, I did this early on is, you know, somebody pulls out a cell phone to take a picture of you and you go, Oh my, what's that evil device you have? You know, you ignore mm -hmm. those things. Mm -hmm. And, and, and maybe, you know, one, one thing that we want to talk about are tips to aspiring historians, but, but, but we treat everybody. I try to treat everybody as if they're standing there in the same type of clothing that I'm, that I'm in. Okay. Uh, so, so, you know, we got, we've got the public, the public coming in in blue jeans, crazy t-shirt, uh, whatever slogan is on there. Uh, I am doing my best to respond to them as if this fellow from the next town had just walked in from a hunt and, you know, he's got, got his, his all of his equipment with him and, and, and I'm going, and I'm just going to meet him on that, on that plane, on that, on that level. Okay. You're bringing uh, so, them along so, with you, so to speak. Uh, that that that's what that's what we, we attempt to do. We, Carol and I both, uh, we do we do first person, uh, where where we are we are that that person, but we are very rarely 
a specific person. Right. We like to call what we do being a character demonstrator. So whether I'm a preacher, I am, I am portraying life as if I am a preacher. I'm not, I'm not a, a particular person. I, you know, in order for me to be able to reenact a, a 18th century minister accurately, I'd have to find one that was 67 years old. Right. And George Whitfield died at, uh, at 53. Um, you know, we, we, we would have to have to do that research, but I can do a generic uh, and still and still get the, the information across. Carol is an indentured servant. Uh, we, we do have a name for for her character, but it is a compilation of primary source data that has built built that that person. Hmm. Uh, so and, and, and then and then we respond based based on that. And, and, and when a when a question comes up that we can't deal with in first person, we'll slip into second person, we'll slip into third person. And, and, and then, and then when it's appropriate, we'll go back to, to, to what we're doing. And, and we haven't rare, rarely do we have anybody objecting. Uh, right. Some, some, some public get uncomfortable and you can read your crowd and you can just, you can just slip in and out of it. Huh. So what I, I kind of want to go back to the the start here when it at least when it comes to your your character demonstration. So you, you've you've built up your kind of lineup of characters, we'll say what goes into it and how does that start? Does it start with just kind of generic research or do you go into it with an idea of, oh, you know, we want to focus on indentured servants or, oh, we want to we want to focus on you know, a, a, a parson for this time period, you know, how does, how does that work? And, and how, how did you get, or, or where do you go then once you have that idea of where you'd like to go with it? Well, again, I, in 2003, 2004, uh, 2005 is the first time I stepped foot on an event and, uh, and did a sermon. Uh, we did, we visited events prior to that. Uh, but, but, but Parson John was the, uh, was, was the persona that was going to be, and it still is my, my, my main persona. Mm. It's Parson John because my first name is John, but I'm a Southern boy. We go by our middle names. <laughs> that's why that's why you're calling me Frank. So I'm John Frank. Parson Frank didn't sound nearly as cool. Uh, <laughs> but 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 Parson John, again, I, I came in knowing this this is this is what I want to do. And, and we get asked, uh, who can I be? Well, find out where you are, when you are and why you are. Uh, you know what? Where? What's? What's going to? What's? What's going to be? Going to be happening? So a minister on the, on the East Coast is going to be, acting a little bit different, a little, preaching a little bit different than a minister here on the, the middle of the frontier. Uh, but again, I'm so I'm I'm looking at, I'm looking at primary source, documentation. We we went to eBay, and and started uh-huh. started purchasing, books of 18th century sermons. They are incredibly cheap, uh-huh. uh, inexpensive. Uh, now there are some that are specific that get way, way, way up there. Uh, I bought a, I bought a Bible that was printed in 1725. It was missing a few pages, so it was affordable, and then it was rebound, so it looks looks like the it is the real thing. But now it has a has a has a proper binding on it, which it didn't have when I bought it. Uh, and and so I can I can read what was what was George Whitfield? What were John Newton? What was uh, Jonathan Edwards? All these, these 18th century ministers, either here or in England, and there's plenty of data for here. What were they saying? What were they preaching? How were they talking? Hmm. And so, and so when I go to craft a sermon, I can, I can leave out any modern reference and I can throw in some of the, the terminology, the phraseology, and, and then my character that I am demonstrating then gains uh, a period legitimacy. Right. Uh, so, so then, so then with, uh, with Maggie Delaney, uh, Carol's primary, uh, primary persona is, um, fellow of the name of Gary Barker did a, did a presentation for us. We, we got into re- reenacting in 2006. We actually held an event, the craziest thing I've ever done. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and we did it at the Red River Meeting House. And I called it a discussion of religion. And I had various various people come in. I had volunteers that that showed up. Mark Sage came, uh, Gary Barker came, uh, and 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 Gary the second year did a presentation on the lore sort of people. Hmm. And this this 
interest struck a, struck a chord with, with, with Carol. She didn't like to be the minister's wife. She found that incredibly boring. Hmm. So when he did this presentation, she said, I can get in on this. Once she heard that presentation, then, then she was able to, to start doing, doing her own, her own research. It was like a, like a, somebody lit the candle. We can't say a light bulb went off because there is no such thing. (laughs) Uh, And, 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 and then for instance, We've done for for several years now. We've done the body snatcher thing. Mm. Okay, how can a minister do that? Yeah. Well, and 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 how did we even find that? Well, Carol's a teacher. I've, I've done some teaching too. Uh, Carol, what well, was a teacher? We retired, and and she would she developed a class uh, on on uh, literature in the Romantic period, and in order to teach the students what was going on in the culture. She did some research. She ran into a phrase that talked about body snatching. She wondered, well, that's weird. Never heard of this. And, and so she started digging, no pun intended, and found out that there's a vast amount of, amount of information. So it's a, it's a, it's a passion. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is, it, our overarching passion is for what we do as, as a minister. I am an ordained minister. So that, that, that's kind of a natural Right. Uh, with, with, with her being being a teacher, she finds something like that. She wants to teach it. So then we build we build that uh, the uh, the museum that we have. Uh, some photos are are available online. It's a museum of of jobs of, of the of the lowest lowest parts of society. And again, it was it was reading. It was an idea. And over a period of time, seeing look at them, look at what these people are doing. You know, these kids, these, these little bitty boys and girls, they're mudlarks. They're going out to the edge of the river and they're wading through the mud and, and trying to find anything of value that they can sell to buy a little bit of something to eat. Well, let, let's talk about that. Mm-hmm. And so that's, that's, that's how we, how we develop. And then, and then we develop the characters to go, to go with it. So old Badger, who is the body snatcher, uh, was a was a natural uh, a natural thing coming out of out of that that research. Right. But we but we attempt to make the we 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 dig as deep as we can. And again, we're not projecting backward onto this. Right. Yeah. Uh, if I were if I were a body snatcher in eighteen hundred, what would I do? No, no. This this is uh, and in this case, we found a diary of a resurrectionist. So we know what their tools were like. We know what their attitudes were. We know, we know all these things and, and that's, that's, that, that's how we then, how we then build and, and, and go forward with that. Hmm. I love that. I, I, I'm finding myself more and more drawn to kind of that end of things. And I think chronologically, the, the podcast episodes probably show that based on you know, who I'm talking to and about what. You, you, you talked to Dodger not long ago. Phineas Dodge is what was one of Badger's uh, crew. Okay. I think you call him Mike Judson. Okay, gotcha. Yep. <laughs> you see, you see, you see. He 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 come he comes over occasionally. Yep. And 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 jumps into the into the mix with this, <clears throat> and uh, plays. And, yeah. we, and we have a good time. But but then again, he also is then bringing in. He says, "Okay, I've done this research on eighteen twelve, and he knows." how they're doing it in 1812. We know how they're doing it in 1790, 1767. Uh, and so it just fleshes the thing out. Right. You're able to I share that research. Flesh. You're able to share that research and kind of fill out areas that each right. other might not be necessarily as familiar with. Exactly. Going back, going back to one of the first statements that I made. Yeah. Is that, that community and that network that you begin to build? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. This podcast is brought to you by Thor Bullets. I've talked about Thor Bullets for over a year now, and uh, and I'd like to thank them again for their sponsorship. I have since, in this amount of time, went out and tested these bullets on my range. I have not gone hunting with them, but in my penetration testing and my accuracy testing with my CVA Acura LRV2, I have to say that the Thor Hammer bullets size to my bore for that Acura do a phenomenal job. I have sub one inch groups at 100 yards. If I do what I'm doing, 
uh, right with the rifle. Uh, really can't speak highly enough of these bullets. I, I think you should try them, not just because they're supporting the show, but because they are performing really well in the tests that I am doing. I also want to say real quick here that they have come out with their Thor muzzleloader practice bullets. These are a 50 caliber, 230 grain sabotaged lead bullet for you to get out. It's a little bit of a cheaper option for you to get out and shoot your muzzleloader, practice with your muzzleloader a little bit more. And in general, get more familiar with your muzzleloader without using the Thor patented, you know, hunting premium bullets that uh, we've been talking about here for a while. So that's something for you to check out, something for you to consider. Uh, there's a lot of muzzleloader bullets out there, but uh, really can't thank Thor enough for their support of I Love Muzzleloading. And, uh, you know, talking with the guys over at Thor, the, the mission and the kind of people that they are, uh, they're really the kind of people that I will continue to support through my lifetime and, and my muzzleloading career, uh, apart from the sponsorship. Uh, they've done right by me, and uh, it's been it's been a lot of fun working with them. So check out Thor Bullets. Not really a structured ad read here, but um, I hope that you, you, you know, check out maybe some of the practice bullets they've got. And uh, as you're planning for your fall 2022 hunts here, check out some of the Thor Hammer Bullets. This podcast is brought to you by Muzzleloader Magazine, the publication for traditional black powder shooters. Since 1974, Muzzleloader has been the leading magazine devoted to traditional black powder hunting and shooting. Each issue is jam-packed with articles on hunting, shooting, gunsmithing, do-it-yourself projects, living history, American history, book and product reviews, and much, much more. Muzzleloader Magazine is the best traditional muzzleloading magazine, bar none. I'd like to thank Jason at Muzzleloader Magazine for his continued support of I Love Muzzleloading and the I Love Muzzleloading podcast. I don't care what you're into. If you're interested in muzzleloading, this is the kind of magazine I think you need to check out. I've been a fan of Muzzleloader Magazine even before the sponsorship. Uh, I've always been impressed with what Jason has been able to put out with Muzzleloader Magazine, and it really means a lot for him uh, to be supporting I Love Muzzleloading and our efforts over here. Thank you, Muzzleloader Magazine, for your support. So what drew you then to kind of the, the late 18th century? I mean, it's a really common period uh, for the area that we're in here in the eastern half of the United States. But I always like to ask just to kind of get some perspective. And my passion was, uh, was, was the religion on the frontier. Uh, we've, got, we've got the first great awakening happening in the 1740s. This is going up in, uh, uh, in, the, in the New England, northern New England, Massachusetts area. With uh, with Jonathan Edwards, can you got, can you walk us through that that first Great Awakening a little bit? I, I, I'm ashamed to admit I'm not very familiar with the term. Oh, okay. What what we have what we have is uh, Northampton, Massachusetts is is where Jonathan Edwards is is a minister. He's going to preach uh, one of the sermons that he preaches during this time period is very famous. It's called "Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God." Okay. And as he's preaching this this sermon, there there's there uh, we would in the 18th century call it a a religious excitement. Uh, and we're not talking about exciting yelling, but we're talking about about people being being touched uh, spiritually by 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 the message being being convicted uh, in this case of of their their sinful condition, needing to to know they need a change, and and we're seeing we're seeing this 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 grow from from just a few churches into into a lot lot of churches at the same time in England the Wesleys and, and George Whitfield are seeing the same thing and uh, and and this is this is a, a revival uh, Benjamin Franklin is going to write about this okay and in his autobiography he's going to write that in Philadelphia there's a period of time that you can't go down a back street without hearing hearing him singing in the houses. And that you could put a bar of gold on the on the sidewalk and nobody would touch it. There was there was such a religious awakening, uh, which is what we're we're calling the, the the great awakening. Okay. And so we're we're seeing that happen there. Prior to it, we're we're seeing just a uh, a lack of of anything religious. Now, when we say religious in the 18th century, we are talking talking Christianity. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so we're not we're not we're not bringing in other outside religions, uh, but uh, uh, so so we have this we have this reawakening of a uh, of a faith, uh, uh, a faith in God, 
and 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 the same thing is then going to happen in 1800. There's a similarity between Northampton, Massachusetts, and Logan County, Kentucky. Okay. Both of them, in their respective time frames, 60 years apart, were the frontier. Right. You've got you've you've got problems with the natives. They're in the middle, right in the middle of Massachusetts. You know, uh, David Brainerd is a missionary to the to the to the natives, and he makes it all the way to Pennsylvania once. <laughs> which you know you look at a map it's just it's a, you know it's a quarter of an inch right but, but but it was it was a huge thing then well we've got the exact same atmosphere happening in 1800 in Kentucky huh. and so there we're seeing the, the the same patterns of of religious awakening taking place uh and I've got a, I've got a book written in 1880 that chronicles the second great awakening that eight million people were converted to Christianity between 1800 and 1880 as a result of the revival that happened in Kentucky. Hmm. So, so there, there's my, my primary thing. And, and again, what I thought I was going to do is go into churches and, and tell them about that because we're not far from the same attitude, the same culture now as they were leading up to 1800 or as they were leading up to, to, to 1740. Uh, so, so there, there's, there's my interest. There's my, my niche, if, if, if you will. Yeah. And, and, and so, so when I, when I go to an event, uh, if I, if I'm at a Rev War event, that is, that is 1780, uh, I am a minister in 1780 and I moved my birthday. I'm still 67 years old. <laughs> well, I wasn't 20 years ago when I started, but <laughs> whatever age I am, I just simply moved my birthday. And 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 then and 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 Parson John is there with his servant Maggie Delaney. Maggie is doing the laundry, and the public are 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 there. And and I walk up and I I say something rather rather gruff to Maggie, like you know, stop talking and get back to work. Uh, and when I do that, I generally just turn and turn and walk away, like like I, I feel that, that that I would do in that in that situation. Mm-hmm. And 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 the public turn to. Joseph Martin to Billy Heck and, and say, say, how can you let him talk to her like that? And he just holds up his hand. He said, look, she belongs to him, not me. It's not my, not my problem. <laughs> and then he turns and walks away. And, and, and the public sitting there uh, learning what the attitudes would have been. We're not saying it was right. Not, not at all. Right. Uh, yeah. But, 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 but this, this is the type of interaction that, uh, that, that you could have, could have seen existing in that time period that was 20 right yeah you know you, you see me on the street today i can't wear the same clothes i wore when i was in high school but i wore the, wore the same styles <laughs> in the church you know, button down shirt i'm, I'm that's, really that's, interested in that because i've i've been seeing that and, and thinking about a lot of that in in like the history of rifles in a, a batch of originals i was able to see recently uh, there were a couple there are a couple of rifles that were made in the early 19th century. And the same thought came up because they were, they built and almost felt a little bit out of time until yeah. you look at the age of the builder when they were building it. And they were right. trained by that previous generation. And so you right. have these guys building these rifles influenced by the modern materials and parts and, and maybe a little bit of the style. But they're still right. holding on to what they were taught, you know, as an apprentice. And it's well, the I same mean, kind that, of thing. That, that, that rifle feels right to them. Yes. You know, and, and yeah, 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 that's, that's, uh, that's, that, that's great. So when we're, you're talking about previous, uh, you know, before this great awakening in the 1740s, what, what did the culture look like then? And this is maybe just my own personal interest here, but I've got you. So I'm going to, I'm going to ask, cause we, yeah. we hear a lot about, you know, the religious ties at the beginning and, and during the colonial era here in the United States for the Europeans that were coming over. But what you're presenting here sounds like it, it went a little bit by the wayside in this period and, and didn't really come to be a real force in the colonies until the latter half of, of the 18th century. Right, but but uh, you know, look at look at where they are and 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 when they are. Again, we're we're in the middle of we're in the middle of Massachusetts and 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 not that far from Boston, and we're we're seeing uh, Indian problems, uh, 
I'm using maybe an insensitive term there, but uh, uh, you know they 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 they've got people out there that are that are that are abusing either way, and and so so we have we have this 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 controversy. Life is hard. Life life is hard. Yeah, thank you. Life is hard, and 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 what are we doing? We've got to eat. We've got to have shelter, and and so while while I can do that and maintain my faith, it is going to take a back seat to that survival to, to, to that, to that survival. Huh, and okay. that's what, again, what, what, what we're seeing in the 1800s. Now I can speak a little better to the 1800, early 1800s, mm-hmm. uh, well, 1790 through, through, uh, 1800 Logan County, Kentucky was known as rogues Harbor. And we had two factions here. Uh, we had the, the regulators and the, and the rogues. And, and so, You've got you've got somebody that that, that would come into the uh, into the community, and uh, say say there would be a, a a circuit rider come in, and and he would disappear, and this fellow over here would have his horse, and that fellow over there might have his hat, and that fellow over there might have his gun, you know it it was it was it was the wild west, right? Okay, yeah. Uh, before the wild west became the wild west. Uh, <laughs> Wildest, but, but, wild but, west granddaddy at the- <laughs> yeah, exactly exactly so 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 we can we can we can see these things uh horse racing cards gambling drinking uh, all the things that good that go along with it were were what's what's come here and if you think about it you know some and this is a generalization this isn't this isn't everybody but if you're in trouble on the east coast where are you going to go you're going to go where there's not as much law hmm and so, so, so that that's what that's what we're finding here. Uh, we do have we do have three churches in Logan County that uh, that are are established starting about 1785 uh, up through up through begin just before 18, 1800. and then a Presbyterian minister comes out of uh, out of the Carolinas, and he comes in and he starts starts preaching, and and praying, and sees then the people begin to uh begin to change now, i can go into the theological reasons for that and that's another discussion for another day <laughs> but but you know i i can go there <laughs> right uh and, and but 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 then 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 you see you you see you see a change there between 1797 and then 1800 and uh, one instance that i know about uh is uh is a fella out in his out in his field uh, and he he stops his stops his his mule he's plowing or whatever, and he has the idea that he needs to go visit this this particular person, and he does that, and he comes and he gets there and he finds out that several people have had this same the same urge uh, to go to go to this house and they go and they they basically have church, uh, hmm. so we we have we have that that kind of 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 thing and again we're we're seeing then the rogues are. Are not being run out. The rogues are being absorbed into uh, this this religious awakening, and it's going to be the same thing in uh, in first grade awakening. Same thing in the the, the Hebrides revivals of the early twentieth century in uh, in Scotland and all that. We're, we're, we can we can chronicle this uh, all the all the way around. That's fascinating. Wow. <laughs> Who'd have thought, huh? Yeah, yeah. I, I'll admit, I didn't expect. To be talking about this, but I'm I'm really really interested in it. it. You know, it's just kind of a cultural movement for this time period because it yeah. it shakes up a lot of the a lot of the narrative that we hear about about history and, and about at least the history in the, in this part of the United States. Um, and I I am connecting periods now in in terms, especially with with some of the art history that I've studied in the past and, and, and what we see on, you know, carvings and paintings and furniture coming out of these periods. And I'm starting to get, you know, like we were talking about earlier, some more of that context to what was happening and how it was happening. So, so if I, so if I'm going to go to Logan County, Kentucky, I can either come in as a, as a religious person or I can come in as a rogue. Right. And, and, and if I want to, and, Oh, Badger, would, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be beyond doing this of, of coming in and 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 organizing some card games and some fisticuffs and you know and all the other other worldly things to give people an idea of what what would be 
what 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 the attitudes would what would be there. Mm-hmm. Let me let me give you let me give you another example of of putting myself in a time and a place. Now I do I do the 18th century minister who is Parson John. I do the 1812 minister who is uh, Reverend Griswold, and Griswold is a family name, and uh, so I so I you know I I'm, I'm fortunate that I can kind of pull these these things these things into my portrayals. Yeah, but. I was asked at one point, we were doing an 1812 event. We were going to, to be, to be portraying the attitudes of the abolitionists and such George, uh, uh, William Wilberforce and, uh, and John Newton and all in his later years. And, and one of the, one of my fellow reenactors, uh, wrote me a letter and he said, he said, tell me, tell me Reverend Griswold's attitude on slavery. And my response to him was, well, my attitude on slavery would be much different than my father's hmm. because Parson John actually owns an, an Irish servant. And so he he sees in that culture that you don't mistreat anybody. But but the fact of the matter was most of these people had servants and, and or a lot of these people. I can't even say most, but a lot had servants and slaves. Hmm. And I said, so but 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 Reverend. Griswold's attitude is he is a staunch abolitionist. He he sees the evils of that. That uh, were his father still alive at that point, you know, we can make this up at, at some point. Uh, they would they they would have some 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 heated dis- disagreements on that. Right. Just as somebody so, might today. Ex- exactly. So I, I don't let I don't let the portrayal of something uncomfortable come between me and the portrayal of that uncomfortable thing. You, you know what I mean? Well, I think that we, we talked about that a little bit this summer over dinner where we were discussing some of your research and, and I really, it's an admir- admirable trait um, for you. And, and I think it's, that's really important. Um, and I, I really have a lot of respect for you that you aren't, aren't shy and you don't shy away from this stuff. Um, and yeah. Have you, have you found difficulty in that? In, in recent I, I years, have, especially, I, I have I have been on some some interviews uh, at times where where some of the comments have been have been how can you uh, how can you say something like that and, and 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 the understanding needs to be I'm not I'm not saying something like that but do you want to know what those people thought right and if you want to know what those people thought let's get outside our comfort zone let's not be crass and 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 insensitive. But yet, uh, we were at we were at Martin Station. Uh, Billy Heck, <laughs> well, when you be interviewing him, okay? Uh, <laughs> Billy Heck, of course, for 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 a, a lot of a lot of his career there was Joseph Martin. Mm-hmm. That's a, as I'm continuing to read, I'm, I'm trying to set out to read more and find more of this documentation and the history and the, and the stories that go along with this. And I feel like it, it provides a, again, that context, I guess, is going to be the key word, the word that everybody's going to remember from this episode, but that, that context. And, and once you understand that and you, you know what was happening and, and what the thought processes were, you know, by reading what these people were writing, what they were saying, and, and you can see how they were behaving, just like it connects with this great awakening. And you see, you know, these changes in, in society in these areas. Right. It's, it's not that you know, it's not that you're passing judgment on, on what was done, Exactly. Or, or or permissing it even. I mean, a lot of terrible things have happened in history to many cultures all over. Right. But 
understand going back and and knowing about them i think is so important and so crucial and even just reading the the few books i have this year i i've seen a a different side of history than i felt like i knew before and and not that it's been doctored or or changed or anything i know it's a, a major concern for a lot of people out there but i just feel like i'm learning more and I'm seeing a, a greater picture of, of how things were happening, how people were living, and what it took to live from a variety of different cultures in this time period. Yeah. And it, yeah. it's very satisfying to, at least for me, <laughs> I don't know if, for other people out there, but to go through and and know this stuff. And it, it gives me a greater appreciation for what we have today and that, right. that we're, we're at where we're at today. Because... You know, especially when we're talking about this 1740 time period on the East Coast, it was hard to live. It was hard to live. I mean, just, I can't imagine. I mean, it's fun for us to go out to an event for a weekend, you know, and get dirty and, and, you know, have a good time. But we get to go, we get to come back to air conditioning and things. And going through and reading these narratives and and reading these stories of, of people writing in their old age about what life was like. It's just like, it's just, whoa. You know, it's, it's, I don't know. I'm kind of off on a, yeah. on a side trail yeah, no, there. No, but no, that, that, that's, that, that's exactly, that's exactly the thought processes that, that, that we go through. You know, I've got a map that or I've got a copy of a map. It's not an original that was done in, uh, in the 1760, 1750, 1756, I think. And, and when you look at the, 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 the centers of population, mm-hmm. they're all within miles of the coast. Yeah. And then when you get out to the to the, to the middle of the country, you say you have a, a notation that says lots of buffaloes, country full of mines. You know, it's, yeah, they, you, they're, they're gone. I wonder what's out there, you know, and the rivers are obviously not accurate to the to the rivers. Uh, uh, at least the small tributaries are not. So so where's the population? So these people that are coming out into this literally wilderness are are. Uh, are, are, are hitting hitting uh, hitting hitting a difficult a difficult survival but they're bringing their attitudes with them they're bringing their culture with them they're going to respond based on how they how they were brought up mm-hmm. and you're able to by looking at such a wide range of history with that you're able to to answer those questions and and provide some of that feedback even if in just a short conversation with somebody Right. And, and the most important thing I can say is I don't know. <laughs> the last thing I want to do is make something up. And right. I hear people do that all the time. And I've had, I've had, I've had the temptation. I think I can, I think I can pull this one over on them. No, no I can't. Hmm. And, and if I were an 18th century person living wherever, I, I wouldn't know everything about everybody. Right. You name some general or some gun builder from, a different area than I'm in. I'm not going to have a clue who they are. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think that's important. And I think that that goes along with, you know, kind of the, the quality of the research that continues to be done. I think we're as a, as a community involved in all of this, I think we're okay with, with that. I don't know. And, and yeah. oftentimes I, I get, I'll get recommended to somebody that does, or I'll try to recommend exactly. somebody, you know, or, if I get a question, you should talk to this guy or this guy. Right. Or, or I'll be asked a question and, and, and I'm going to answer. I don't know. And you've, you've got a question that, that, that you sent me. What tips do you have for aspiring historians? And my first, I have people that ask me all the time, where, where, where do I start? Yeah. I say, I start by saying, I don't know. And then, and then even if, even if I'm getting my feet into this, people are going to start asking questions. Well, if I don't do anything about those questions, then I haven't done them any service the next time we meet or the next person is going to come asking that same question. Hmm. And I've done this over and over again is, is, uh, is Parson, what about this? I don't know, but I'm going to look it up. Right. You know, even if I walk around behind the tent and get out my, my magic seeing stone, I'm not going to call it that, and, <laughs> and, and look it up on the, on the spot, uh, I'm not going to do it in front of the, the public, although I have at times, uh, because, the, because the context of the conversation uh, demanded it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but by, the next, by the next weekend, I'm, I'm going to know an answer to that. Hmm. You're, you're, you're using the questions that you, don't, that you get and you don't know the answer to to inform further research. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And well, 
increase increase my my knowledge. I hope more of it comes in than leaks out. <laughs> it, it kind of leaks out leaks out a lot. But but you know what 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 kind of sources do we have? We have primary sources. I mean we've got we we've got we've got good sources. Uh, we we've got uh, I, don't, I don't know if you would call the Draper manuscripts a primary source or a secondary source. Sometimes mm. it was people recollecting yes. you know, 20, 30, 40 years after the, after the fact, but it's in some instances, it was the people themselves or their, or their children. So you're, so you're in the, you're in the secondary at, at, at that point. But uh, what, what, what did George Washington say? I've got a friend that had a, had a series of, had a set of books that were all the letters that they had of, of, uh, of George Washington. Hmm. You want to know what George Washington said? You can go read it. Right. You don't have to guess. You know, or, or, or yeah, yeah, you don't have to guess. Or, or you can take somebody. You, you know, don't don't do the cliff notes. Uh, don't do, uh, don't don't put a lot of stock in Wikipedia. Other than, look at the sources. Hmm. Uh, go to archive.org, and 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 you've got you've got uh, reproduced uh, books of of the period. Uh, if you want uh, if you want scholarly information, go to JSTOR J S T O R dot dot org. Uh, and and you can see what what the scholars are writing. You can download those those dissertations, and then you can compare those to your primary sources, because everybody interprets it. <laughs> but if I know the culture and I know the setting behind it, then I'm going to know why this person in 1770 said this, and it doesn't mean what we think it means sometimes. Right. So they're 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 they're, they're still sifting through. They're still. Uh, still all of that, but, but again, I, I like your, I like your thing. Context, context is king mm -hmm. in, in, in this. <laughs> this has been really great, Frank. I, <laughs> I'm really, I'm really pleased with, this has got my, my brain turning in a way I didn't expect yeah. it to. And I really like that. Um, oh, that's cool. You know, you, as much as you are a, a very respected and and a very honorable guy, especially you know meeting in person, talking with in person, there is that little Kentucky ornery, and um, <laughs> at least in this conversation for me, I'm not sure about the listeners, but for me, I'm getting a little bit of that, and it's getting me feeling a little ornery, a little spry about this. <laughs> well, there you go, there uh, you go. Uh, my 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 family's been in this been in these lands since uh, since the 1630s. Since the Both 1630s. Sides of my family, on my mother's side, uh, coming into Connecticut, my dad's side coming into uh, uh, into Maryland, wow. and and my, my tenth great grandfather, whose name was John Jarbo, was arrested for breaking Lord Baltimore's Tolerance Act. He insulted the Protestant governor William William Stone. Huh. Cost him a couple thousand pounds of tobacco for doing that. Really, and we haven't we haven't stopped speaking up, speaking our mind ever since. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. That's that's the American spirit right there, I feel like. There you go. <laughs> um, what would you recommend? Um, you know, we've talked a little bit about research. You know, would you recommend that folks start researching first? Or, you know, would, would you recommend people get out to events and, and start talking to, to some of the people out at events? Or... You know the, the 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 first idea the first idea that, that that we have other than saying I don't know is 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 what what's the what's what's the passion? Hmm. Okay, you know I'm a, I'm a I'm a I'm an engraver I'm a I'm a gun builder I'm a I'm a woodworker I'm I'm a stonemason I'm a welder I'm you know I'm so you know I'm I'm, I'm doing things with my hands or I'm a I'm a teacher I'm a philosopher I'm a, I'm a minister you know what what do I think I might want to want to learn about you know what i mean yeah uh and and then and then and then in order to fine-tune my research okay so yeah yeah rev war let's let's do rev war okay so you start doing rev war you're going to learn about f and i you're going to learn about 1812 and all you know the things that go around it so who are you and and not not as not a specific person i'm a i'm a cabinet maker right in 1770 well, where are you going to be? Are you going to be on the frontier? You might be making something a little bit different than you are if you're in Williamsburg. Uh, so I'm going to be in Philadelphia. Okay. So what? What is what? There, there we are. Who we are? Where are we? And 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 when are we? Then I said. Then I'm going to dive into the dive into to primary sources of of people that are doing that very thing. Okay. 
And that's your starting point, you know, the who, that's, that's, what. That's, that's my starting point, yeah. Okay. So once you kind of answer those questions there, you know what to start researching, what to start looking for. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and who knows, who knows, you might, you might read a line in one of the books that says, and the body snatchers, wait a minute, wait a minute. Yeah, <laughs> who are those? <laughs> who, who, who are those? So, so you know, rabbit trail, the, the, the secret to rabbit trails while you're preaching, you've heard about ministers, you know, they kind of get off subject and start running like, kind of like I'm doing in this conversation <laughs> is, is if the rabbit is sitting still and it's a clear shot, take it. Hmm. But if it's if it's outrun you and gone off down the trail, so you don't know where it's gone, you might want to be you might want to temper that one just a little bit. It right. doesn't mean you can't go there, but uh, but 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 that's uh, my goodness. We I, I can't think of names right off the top right now, but I, but I've seen in the in the the few years that we've been doing this, uh, I've seen I've seen people uh, move from one portrayal to another, and it seems that each time they make a move, they get they they get a little bit a little bit deeper. You you just interviewed Simeon, didn't you? Yes. And the first time I met Simeon, he was not the reenactor that he is now. Hmm. But he 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 grew. He 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 put himself in contact with 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 people that had the knowledge, mm-hmm. and and you know because he already had the skills to do what he's doing. He just had to fine tune them into an 18th century 18th century way. Yeah. So here's another example, and, and another rabbit trail. When I'm preaching a sermon at Martin Station, Simeon is standing outside the, the gate of the fort watching. He's there, he's there to protect me hmm. just in case something, something happens and, and the enemy comes, comes up. And it's, and it's, and it's, and it's fun to, to, to watch that, that type of interaction take place. Mm-hmm. Hmm. It, it kind of fills out the environment. Yeah. 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 There you go. Huh. That's, that's something I really enjoy and I'm, I'm coming to enjoy more. Uh, I've always f- thought of myself as kind of a lifelong learner, not necessarily that I wanted to sit in school or, or sit in a lecture hall all day. Uh, I kind of had my fill of that, but just <laughs> this is a, a hobby in a community that, that welcomes that. And right. I, I look back even just, you know, a few months ago when we were we were talking at Kalamazoo at the Kalamazoo show and I look at, at what I was wearing then and what I've learned just this year to improve it. And being there, there weren't people, you know, pushing me away because of my, my rather amateur presentation. That's just where I was at. Right. But I know right. that the next time I go and meet, I'm gonna learn and meet people, I'm gonna learn more. And I'm going to know more and I'm going to come back knowing more. And there's just this, uh, an appreciation for that. I'm in the same shape. I mean, nothing, no, nothing stays static. If it stays static, we're going backwards. Right. I think of it just like shooting. Each time I go out and shoot my, my muzzleloader, I'm getting a little bit better. It's a little bit of that practice. And yeah. I, I, I equate all of these because I, I grew up shooting. So for me, a lot of things are, are a metaphor. There's a, there's a shooting metaphor for them. Right. But I just look at it as that, you know, each target is, is some practice. And each time I, I research or each time I go to an event or, or I have one of these discussions, I'm, I'm one step further. I'm, I'm another, you know, I'm another step closer. Not that we ever get, we ever get there, you know, but right. it's that journey that we're all on that, that makes us really enjoyable. Yeah. I preached a sermon once on shooting. Tell me about uh, that. Uh, it was, uh, well, I don't, I don't remember the, the exact gist of everything, but, uh, but I was watching Mike Miller shoot and, and I was, I was watching, uh, uh, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm just a I'm senior moment, senior moment, Sanders, Leroy Sanders. I was watching Leroy Sanders shoot and, and, and Leroy, who was, who was very, infirm at the moment you know his his arthritis and all was 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 bad he won the shoot (laughs) and i said i said leroy how do you how do you do that and he he gave me one word he said follow through (laughs) and 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 and, you know he doesn't pull the trigger and then look to see if he hits the target Mm -hmm. (laughs) if you have to look at that point you you've lost right yeah you know (laughs) and 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 life is the same way and then our christianity is the is, is is the same way that that 
that there is a there is a follow through to our, to our actions. Yeah, so I you know I, I waxed wise for twelve minutes on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll have to we'll have to get a rifle in your hands here at some point, and uh, I, I love it. <laughs> we'll, we'll make that happen. We can start uh, giving you some context for the next follow through. I, I need some more context. There you go. <laughs> I need a right eye that works first. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I can't help you with that. I, yeah. I might be able to take the eye out, but I don't know about anything. Yeah. <laughs> well, Frank, if if somebody's interested in kind of what we've been talking about, and uh, you know, where can people go to to find your work and maybe see a little bit of what you've what you've been talking about in practice here? Uh, I've got I've got three websites that are in that are in in the the for the process. Well, parsonjohn.org. Uh, parsonjohn.org is uh, is is our our website. We have our schedule up there. We've got a little bit of a little bit about us and and, and things and some of the some of the presentations that that we do. Uh, and then I've just started uh, two websites this past year. One is called travelingchurch.org. Uh, we're going again. We're going forty two weekends out uh, each year. Uh, each you know, forty two weekends each year, and and so. Uh, I am I am the pastor to a lot of people mm -hmm. that are that are coming to reenactments, uh, public and and reenactors alike, uh, and so I, I instituted that, and I've got a little bit of information. That 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 one that one's growing. The one that the one that's probably most relevant to to some of our conversations is how do we know where to go? Where where are we? Where where can we go and meet uh, meet meet me meet meet anybody? Uh, meet these reenactors? Ask ask these questions. And so we developed reenactingschedule.org, mm -hmm. uh, and and there we've got uh, over a hundred events listed on there now. Uh, back in the day, we had a a newspaper that went through the reenacting community called Smoke and Fire. Well, that that has Donlan has retired from that. The lady that was was doing it, and I went to her and I said, Is, "Would this be a good idea?" She said, "Oh yes, so you you've got my support to uh, to to take up this." So. A central clearinghouse of where uh, the reenact reenactments are, where the living history events are, and then we are building. We're doing a rebuild on that site this this winter to add additional resources uh, in into that. Uh, but beyond beyond that, that's that's us. That's Parson John and Maggie. Our, we have a YouTube channel, Parson John and Maggie. Uh, is is to dig into those dig into those primary sources. Uh, I go on eBay all the time and look. I bought a book not, not long ago on husbandry. That's not being married. That's animals. Mm -hmm. uh, and and you know it was how to how to trim how to trim hooves how to how to take care of your livestock things like that. So it, and it was like like twelve bucks because mm -hmm. uh, nobody wanted to know that information. Right. But I've got all kinds of stuff in there now. Of, of they, they give me context uh, context to who 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 I, who I can be. Right. Well, I have to say I'm I'm a huge fan of your work and and have been for a long time. But I think the reenacting schedule dot org is really one of my, you know, one of the things I'm happiest to see, um, just because it it fills a hole that needed filled and it brings it into the contemporary space. Like you said, the pre the predecessor was, you know, a print newspaper that could go out, but with right. it being online, it, it opens up so many doors and and makes it so much more accessible to somebody who might not necessarily know about this or that they want to get into it, but they can find it, uh, you know, for free, they can find an event. And this isn't, you know, a, a paid promotion of it. I've, I've been, you know, shouting out the website for many months now, just because it's such a great idea. And I'm yeah. so happy to see it. Um, and so, at, at, uh, at Kalamazoo trade fair in particular, and other, other trade fairs, I'll probably have my computer with me, but we'll, we'll have a table set up there with, uh, in the middle of the room where we work, we work staff there for, for Kalamazoo, but I'm had it there last year, introducing reenacting schedule.org. And this year I'm going to be there uh, and be able to literally put the plug, the events into it to give Wonderful. people a hands on of, 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 of how, how it, how it works, how they can get their events, uh, events listed and go ahead and get them listed while we're there. Yeah. I think that's great. I mean, it's, it serves as a great library for wherever you're at in the country. You can start searching through here based on the, the dates or based on the era, I believe, right? right. That you're interested right. in and, and find an event to, to go to. 
I found I found out that there are there are reenactors in uh, northern Michigan that do lumberjack. Really? And I think, how cool is that? Is that like early 20th century style stuff? Yeah. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Boy, we might have to drive up there, Frank. That sounds like fun. There you go. <laughs> well, Frank, is there anything else that you'd like to talk about? Is there anything that we missed? Um, I think I think we've hit the we've hit the highlights here. Okay. I would I would simply say you know come see us. Yeah. Uh, we uh, we attempt to get to get most places. What's the next event that you'll be at? Uh, next event I'll be at will be Red River Meeting House, January the first. We do a we do a Sunday service there on on the first the first Sunday of the of the year, and I think it does happen to be on January first this year. Uh, then we uh, we have trade fairs. We have Linton Trade Fair, Noblesville Trade Fair, uh, trade trade fair circuit. Uh, you've just prompted me to get the schedule up on parsonjohn.org. <laughs> uh, and and if you go there now and look at our schedule, you're going to see where we were last year. I'll be updating those uh, within uh, within within the week. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we are so, kind so of at the end of the year here, so it's kind we of a, are, we <laughs> are right here. It's it's starting. We we are booked every every weekend in in January somewhere. Wow. Yeah. So so it do, it doesn't slow down in the off season. No, it and, doesn't. And it, it is it is great for for your listeners wanting to get into this. Is is get to these get to these indoor trade fairs, mm -hmm. uh, and you're and you're going to meet the gun builders. You're going to meet uh, the people with powder horns. You're going to meet the people with clothing. Uh, all the all the all the available sources. You're even going to find you're, you're going to find people with books, yeah, uh, and and reasonably priced books. And then the material, the buttons, everything that you 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 might want. Don't get overwhelmed. Uh, start start simple. Do your research first, or you'll end up with a yard sale like all of us have done because we bought the wrong thing first. Yep. <laughs> uh, but then, but but also, don't be intimidated by it. Don't be afraid to ask questions. We're in this because we want to. We want to. We want to educate. We want to help. Mm -hmm. Each weekend, an event is like the best two days of school that you could ever dream of. Is how oh, yeah. I think about it. You know, it's oh, like yeah. the best field trip ever. Is is when I'm at an event and it's just all at once. I'm a I'm a young adult and I'm also like seven and I just got off the school bus yeah. and it's just <laughs> <laughs> it's just wild. Yeah, yeah. It it is. It's uh. It's it's rewarding, it really is. And and some of the best friends that we've made in in, in our lifetime have been in in this. Yes, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I'd like to thank Frank again for coming onto the show, and I'd like to thank both Frank and Carol for being. Uh, so kind over the years. I think just about every event that I go to and I have gone to uh, since I was a very young boy, uh, Frank and Carol have been there and they've been kind each and every each and every time from me running around being a little ornery brat to to being the young man that I am today. They've they've always been kind and and seeing that them at events is, is really inspiring how they go through and, and answer questions and dive into this research. Um, it's very inspiring for me and, and kind of what we're trying to do here with I Love Muzzleloading. Um, I, uh, they really have uh, been a, a kind of a guiding, a guiding group, a guiding mentors, we'll say, I guess, um, as to far as understanding more of this history and, and not only understanding it and, and how to research it, but also uh, how to, how to get it out there, how to, how to then, you know, send it out into the public in an understandable manner, if if that makes sense, um, I'm getting over a, a cold right now, so maybe my brain's not running at, at full bore here. But um, I really, really want to thank uh, Frank and Carol. Even though we didn't have Carol on, maybe we'll have to get her on another episode. Like I said, we've been talking about reenactingschedule.org a few times this year, um, but it really is a, a great service, I think, to the community. Um, both those of us that have been in it for many years and then those of you out there who are just getting into it. Um, this is a great resource uh, that I'm doing what I can to, to help Frank with and, and help send around and, and send people to, to start using it just because it's the kind of thing that, that benefits everybody. Uh, it benefits people trying to get into it and it benefits those of us who've been in, into it for a long time. And um, I think it's a, a worthy cause and I'm very happy to see, uh, somebody of such character as Frank um, here kind of leading that 
for the community here uh, to provide that service. As always, we'll have links to uh, many of the topics discussed. I can't say all, but I do try to go through and make a note and, and save each of the, the items discussed in the show notes down below. So if you'd like to find uh, Frank's website, if you'd like to find his YouTube channel, and as well as his schedule and some of the events that he's at. You'll find those in the show notes or the show description uh, on your podcast player. Typically, you can scroll down and find that. Or uh, if you want one location to find all this stuff, there'll be a blog post going along with this episode at ilovemuzzleloading.com. ilovemuzzleloading.com slash podcast is the home of the podcast where you can find all the links. You can find some photos and you'll find some embedded videos to Frank's work um, in his character demonstrations as well as his wife carols a little bit of housekeeping here uh, as of recording just a few weeks ago we'd passed 10,000 subscribers on the youtube channel this is a big milestone uh, for i love muzzleloading it's one that did not ever expect to get to uh, this quickly here in, in just a year and a half um, but i'd like to thank you uh, listeners out there for your support we uh, we couldn't do this without you we couldn't be reaching uh, muzzleloading enthusiasts of all of all ages and skill levels and, and trying to educate and, and bring more people into the community without without you watching and, and without all the kind words that we, we receive on and offline. Um, it truly means a lot. And I feel like uh, this podcast is really one of my favorite parts uh, of I Love Muzzleloading because we're we're able to go into these deep and, and personal and, and interesting conversations uh, that many of us might have at an event, but we're able to share it, um, you know, in a platform that archives both, you know, Frank's story and, and what he's interested in um, and also shares that information. Um, it's been a, a long passion of mine to to save these stories and save these kind of conversations uh, for for future generations. Uh, my daughter someday will be able to listen to these, um, which really warms my heart. I hope she enjoys them. But I just I just wanted to say thanks as we as we head into the new year. You know, it's the holidays. Um, it's a season to be thankful. But um, you know, not to sound cheesy about it, but I, I truly am thankful for for all of you out there that that are listening and 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 write and and reach out and talk to me at events. Um, it truly means a lot to know that there's such a community out here of like-minded people that care about this kind of stuff and, and want to see it preserved. Uh, I'm not the only one doing it. You know, Frank is, is an icon here uh, doing much more than I am and, and than I can. Uh, but it's it's a lot of fun being a part of this. And, and I truly thank all of you for, for allowing it to happen and, and supporting it uh, as we move forward. So um, 2023... I think will be a, another pretty busy year for I Love Muzzleloading. As far as events go, I hope to make it to the Linton Trade Fair, but um, a lot of times we get a bad snowstorm <laughs> here in northern Indiana that kind of prevents me from traveling a whole lot uh, with the roads being a little risky. I hope to be there. If I'm not there, I will be at the Connor Long Rifles Show in Noblesville, Indiana in February. There's also the Lake Cumberland Show in Kentucky I hope to be at. Again, that kind of lines up with a snowstorm somehow each year. Uh, I do hope to be there. Uh, I, I will be at the Kalamazoo Living History Show in March in Kalamazoo, Michigan. I mention all these events not to promote myself, but to promote good events that I enjoy going to. And if you're there, uh, please stop me and, and let's talk about muzzleloading. That's something I, I've learned to and grown to really love about events is, is meeting up with, and, and talking with people that I might not otherwise be able to talk to. Um, so please, if you see me, if you see that I'm going to be at an event, you know, pull me aside and, and let's talk. You know, I, I love to talk and <laughs> talk about muzzleloading and, and I'd love to hear about how you got into muzzleloading and kind of your thoughts. You know, some of the same questions that I ask a lot of the guests on the show, and the same topics I talk about, I'd love to talk about with you uh, in person at one of these events. So if that's the case, you know, stop by, pull me aside and, and let's talk a little bit. That's all I have for you this week. This is probably most likely the last episode for the year here for 2022. Uh, thank you all for making it possible. Thank you all for making it happen. I'm really looking forward to the folks that we're going to talk to in 2023 and some of the video topics that we're going to be discussing. I think it's, I think muzzleloading and living history in general are, are really on an uptick on an upswing really. As we head into the new year here, there's a lot of great things happening and I think we're going to see some continued growth uh, despite some of the other issues that we have out in the world, just economically and maybe culturally, you know, it can seem like there's a lot of turbulence out there. But I think if anything, it makes uh, makes the muzzleloading and living history community come together a little bit more. You know, it's a, a place where we can all get away and enjoy and kind of let go of, you know, some of the, the things that 
might bother us in the modern world, we can slow down and, and take a step back and enjoy some time with friends and family. And I hope you're able to do that here with Christmas and with New Year's coming up. Uh, truly, truly hope that for you all out there. If you're listening, you know, maybe maybe on your drive to, to see family or you're driving to work like I will be, um, I do hope that you are can take a moment to take some pause and, and take some rest this holiday season. Uh, from me to you, I, I hope that it's an enjoyable one. I'm Ethan. I love muzzleloading. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll catch you next time.